Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Robert. Um, today I'm doing the video for the Classics Book Club and the November selection was Ernest Hemingway's novel of the Spanish Civil War, For Whom the Bell Tolls, which came out in 1940. And I'm going to try something a little bit different for this video. Um, I put together a slideshow of a bunch of pictures from Hemingway's time in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. And then intermixed with those are some pictures from the 1943 Hollywood film, For Whom the Bell Tolls. And so instead of you watching my face for the next 15 minutes, uh, I figured I would go ahead and put together the slideshow and let you see some pictures of Hemingway while I do a voiceover for the actual content part of the video. If it works, let me know. If you're not a fan of this style, let me know and I'll play with something else different for next time for the December title. All right, I hope you enjoy it. The storyline of For Whom the Bell Tolls is actually a pretty simple story. A young American professor, Robert Jordan, uh, who teaches Spanish at the University of Montana, has been working as a dynamiter in the Spanish Civil War. And during the course of this book, which covers about 70 hours of his life, he learns about love, he learns about brotherhood, um, all while spending his last hours of his life preparing for the explosion of a key bridge behind fascist lines in Spain. This book was published in 1940. Um, Hemingway went to Spain as a reporter covering the Republic in 1937, and much of these experiences ended up as material in his novel. And there's there are a number of really important ideas that Hemingway writes about in this book, in some ways they're different from the way he writes about them in some of his other books, and in some ways, of course, they're the same. And probably one of the most important ideas is the idea of character itself. Robert Jordan lives by some really specific values, hard work, uh, dedication to his profession, courage, almost a fearless pursuit of danger, and a total defiance of death. And some critics who write about Hemingway have called this kind of character a code hero. Um, but there's a big difference between Robert Jordan and the typical Hemingway code heroes, and that is that Jordan doesn't serve as a role model to younger men. If you think to um, the old man in the sea, for example, Santiago serves as a role model uh, in that book. Jordan doesn't serve as a role model to anybody, but he does define himself by his work, his teaching, his fighting, etc. Um, all those are at the, the center of his existence. He's really confident of his masculinity and he feels a great need to experience manliness more than to prove that he's manly. Uh, so he's unlike some of the passive heroes or the anti-heroes that we get in some of Hemingway's 1920s novels, for example, A Farewell to Arms. Jordan is active, he's decisive, he's strong, self-reliant, and he's admirable. And so he combines strength and tenderness he has a historical past, and he has a need for some kind of a limited family support, even if it's not a literal family. He believes strongly in a cause, and he's willing to die for it. And he opposes fascism and supports the Spanish people without being taken in by the Communist Party line. And so he's functioning best on his own or with a small band of partisans. And He's also capable of love that is beyond mere physical desire, which is different from some of the other characters. 
The second really big idea in this novel is the concept of duty itself. Jordan's primary concern throughout the whole book, and it's kind of a measuring stick throughout the novel, is his duty. He wants to know if the soldiers are doing their duty, in what spirit are they carrying it out, and whether duty sustains them in the face of death. And we see some other characters, for instance, Pablo seems to fail, but he's really torn between two different duties, the Republican cause and the safety of his partisan family. Ultimately, he does choose the cause though. El Sordo is another character who dies bravely doing his duty. And Selmo uh, at the bridge pulls the wire for the explosives knowing that they may kill him, but it's his duty and so he stays and does it. And Jordan throughout the novel is sustained by his sense of duty. He doesn't question his orders. He carries out his assignment even though it appears to be a suicide mission or a lost cause. Tied with that sense of duty is probably the third big idea, and that's the idea of death. The novel is pretty much an in-depth study of people's behavior when they're confronted with death. And Jordan fortifies himself with memories of historical figures who have acted courageously and who have fought hard and who have died bravely. Uh, El Sordo, for example, dies fighting, unafraid of death. Jordan is haunted a little bit though by the memory of his father's suicide, the model of a man not dying well. Hemingway was haunted by his own father's suicide in 1928, and of course Hemingway goes on to, to commit suicide in the 1960s. But there, there are occasions for Jordan when he even approves of suicide. For example, when his wounded partner asks to be killed to avoid being taken as a prisoner by the enemy, Jordan shoots him to um, put him out of his misery. His love interest, Maria, carries a razor blade that she'll use to cut her own throat if she's ever captured by the fascists. But in the end, Jordan has the opportunity to decide whether to commit suicide or not when he's wounded after the explosion and the fascists are approaching his position in the woods. He can either commit suicide to keep himself from being captured, but he doesn't. He decides to stay and fight and kill as many of the fascists as he can uh, so he doesn't violate his own self-image as a soldier who fights to the finish. He's going to make the enemy be the one to kill him. This is kind of tied to another big idea in this book and Hemingway's other books, the concept of nada in Spanish or nothingness. And that's pretty much a central theme in a lot of Hemingway's works. And it refers to the kind of inevitability, but also the meaninglessness of death, after which there's nothing. So Nada forces one to have kind of an existentialist idea of living life intensely in the here and now, since there might not be a tomorrow. Jordan tries to condense a lifetime of activity into his final few days. Uh, for him, the future isn't very likely, and it's not really that important. It's kind of like El Sordo, who dies facing uh, death bravely, killing as many of the fascists as he can before he's killed himself. And then, of course, if we're going to talk about death, we're going to talk about all these other gloomy ideas, we need to talk about love, too, because this is after all, partly a love story. Love, in a sense, provides emotional support and some sense of normality in the midst of what is otherwise a pretty violent, abnormal setting. It's shown to be even more precious for being so temporary, so momentary. It's not going to stave off death for Jordan, uh, but it can briefly stop time and temporarily block out the other surrounding events. Love makes Jordan's final sacrifice meaningful in some ways uh, when he lays down his life so that Maria and the others may live and escape. I don't talk about symbolism too much um, because I think sometimes it can get 
carried away. But it seems in this book that the bridge is a pretty clear symbol and a pretty important symbol of a lot of the things Hemingway is discussing. And it's, of course, the focal point of Jordan's mission, and it becomes the focal point of the novel. It almost takes on epic proportions in this book because Jordan is is making historical comparisons with other bridges in other wars. Uh, for example, the Roman Horatius holding the bridge across the Tiber River, or the Greek Leonidas at Thermo Thermopylae. Um, by putting it in that context, it gives this bridge even more importance, and so it becomes the symbolic center of the war for Jordan and these partisans. The outcome of General Goltz's battle depends on this bridge, and the outcome of the entire war might depend on this battle, so it becomes a huge symbol in the book. If the fascists can be defeated in Spain, it's possible that a world war to fight fascism won't be necessary. And so the bridge assumes a great importance. It becomes temporarily the symbolic center of the universe. Good men uh, like El Sordo, like Anselmo, die so that the bridge can be blown up. And then when Jordan destroys the bridge, he knows almost intuitively that he's also destroying a symbolic bridge to safety and that there's no way back for him. This book has been talked about quite a bit in the critical literature. Uh, and so just a touch of historical background. In 1936, it's after years of political conflict between the liberal and conservative factions in Spain, uh, a socialist government was elected and that triggered the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. General Franco, a fascist who was against socialism, led the army in a revolt against the elected socialist government. And Franco's conservative political position was supported by the Roman Catholic Church, uh, by wealthy landowners, landowners excuse me, and, and the fascist party, uh, as well as by some of the military advisors from Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy, of course. The socialist government's troops were called the Loyalists because they were loyal to the socialist government or Republicans. They were supporters of the Spanish Republic. Since the Americans, the French, and the British were neutral officially in that war, the Spanish Loyalists' main military su um, support and advice came from Communist Russia, though they were also supported by a lot of foreign volunteers, people like Robert Jordan. The war didn't begin with fascists, fascists trying to overthrow the communists, but this is how it ended up. Um, by March of 1939, Franco's better organized troops had defeated the Loyalist army and the war was over. And of course, this book came out in 1940. Uh, just a quick note before I finish on the meaning of the title. Hemingway used this as a preface to the novel, and he's quoting from Meditation 17 by the English poet John Donne, who lived in the 16th and 17th centuries. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And Hemingway is using that quotation to affirm his belief that humans are not isolated and alone, but they're bound together. And Robert Jordan's death is not an isolated event. The death bell that tolls for Jordan tolls for all humankind. So in a lot of ways, uh, this isn't my favorite Hemingway novel. I'm still probably a fan of The Old Man and the Sea more than any of his other books. But it's one of his most important books, and I think it's one of the most important war books to come out of the 20th century, especially to come out before World War II. And so it's, it's one that I go back to every couple of years. I think I probably read this about six or seven times. Okay, there you have it, uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. Our December title is um, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, which came out, I believe, in 1906. And so not a really cheerful book, but a really important book about the meatpacking industry 
And like with this month's vi video, I'll post my video on the jungle on the last Sunday in December. So if you're reading along, you've got a, a full month to read that before I post my video. And if you're going to post a video, um, please do that on the same day, on the last Sunday of the month. Okay, everybody, I hope you have a great week and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.